All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. This is a comprehensivist Wednesday where we take themes that go across multiple fields. And we have many different series that we are doing. Uh, my friend CJ, who, uh, who is the, uh, you know, who is one of the lights behind the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Um, and we collaborate with them. So CJ has this entire series on different aspects of epistemology, different aspects of how do you pursue, pursue comprehensive, comprehensivism. Sanjay does this series on neuroscience. So I'm delighted to have uh, Sanjay here. Mm -hmm. And Sanjay, yeah. what are we talking about today? And take it away, the floor is all yours, sir. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about a um, little bit of consciousness. It's, it's a very broad topic. So I'm trying to do this in, in stages. Um, we did the first stage um, a few months ago in, in December. And uh, so if you know people who attended that or, or were able to watch the video, that will help you. Um, if not, we'll, you know, we, we will talk about some of the things, but not the, the exact same things. Um, what, what, what I wanted to do is talk today about um, an aspect of conscious, consciousness that's tied to our sense of reality. Um, and also this, our sense that reality is, is not uh, how most people, especially when we're young, how we see reality. Um, reality is actually fragmented. It's, it's uh, formulated by, um, by our mind. Um, it's, it's constructed um, and it's not necessarily um, accurate. Um, oftentimes there are uh, things that our brain and mind do, does that um, gives us a simpler view of reality and that's intentional. So we'll talk about these things and we'll try to um, uh, tie those together and, and we'll have some discussions around that. I, I have some examples, simple examples that, that we'll, we'll look at. So let me um, start the slide. Um, I just had a slideshow that can uh, help us here. I think it should be this one. So hopefully everyone can see this. It's good. Is there, okay, all right. Um, so again, reality and consciousness, that's what we're talking about. So um, first, um, you know, consciousness is, is something that we all have um, and, and it changes over time. There are many aspects to it. It's not a, a static element of our, of our behavior. Um, it and, and and throughout our lives, you know, when when we're uh, when an infant is born, um, or even before birth, um, consciousness is something that's uh, very difficult to understand and, and probably doesn't exist uh, uh, at least in the first two trimesters. Um, and and when a child is born, they do have what we consider consciousness, but it's not necessarily um, the full version that we think of, of adults having. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing we're going to look at is is this thing called reality. And reality, again, is uh, there are different levels of reality that we all have. Um, also, it's uh, something that um, develops over time. Um, there are um, the amount of complexity that uh, comes into our mind, you know, through our senses, um, that develop, helps us develop a sense of reality. Um, and we, again, um, lose it at times, you know, especially when we go to sleep, you know, every, every evening, hopefully. Um, and, and then it comes back in the morning when we wake up. So both of these consciousness and reality have similar aspects. And so I, I decided to, to discuss them both together because they are really, I believe that they're, they're aspects of the same coin, you might say, you know, the same, same thing in our mind. Um, they represent um, um, the world, outside world. Um, but I'll also we'll go into a little more to the end, I'll, I'll tie it into, there's some other ways that they tie together that may not be as obvious. So, so these two um, things we'll talk about. And then we're also going to talk about, um, you know, how this helps form us, you know, the, the perception that we have, the awareness, um, the cognition that we have of knowing who we are. These are all aspects of both consciousness and reality. So we'll tie these together at the end. Um, so, uh, you know, of, of our perception of who we are, you know, uh, we, we have a concept of ourself, we have a concept of the outside, you know, that's outside of our physical body, outside of our mind. Um, and the unification of these concepts is really where we come from. You know, when we talk about us, we are both everything inside of us and everything outside of us. 
combined, unified, is what makes us. If we, if, you know, the, the world we live in creates us. So if we lived in a aquatic environment, if we were porpoises, um, you know, our, our uh, consciousness would be very different. Um, but, and if we lived in space or if we lived on a different planet, for, perhaps, uh, things would be quite different. So, you know, all of these things together make us. Um, so, so we'll talk about these things. Um, first, let's, let's, so we'll touch on consciousness first and we'll go through this and then we'll take a break. Uh, we'll, we'll have some questions and answers that, that after that. And um, I think we can do a, a breakout room after that also. So with consciousness, we wanna talk about a few things. Um, for example, um, what is consciousness, right? And, and one, of the, one of the challenges in neuroscience is especially around consciousness. And it's not you know, in every field that uh, tries to address consciousness, you know, philosophy, um, psychology, every field that, that tries to address this. One of the difficulties is that there are a lot of terms and a lot of vague um, aspects that people intermix and they don't always, when, when we're talking about consciousness, oftentimes we're talking about one specific aspect of it, not necessarily all of it. And so first what I wanted to do is, is go into some of the specific aspects. Um, so first around what? Um, so this concept of waking, right? Um, so when we are, uh, when we're unconscious, we're not aware of anything. We're not even aware that we're unconscious. That's the whole point of, of unconsciousness is that there's no awareness. So waking is, is a moment where we're transitioning from consciousness, so, sorry, subconscious, unconsciousness into consciousness. And it's a transition uh, period. So uh, we may be groggy, um, there may be disorientation. You know, we may have a realization that I just awoke. So this is an element. Um, another element of consciousness is really what we call perception, right? So when we perceive things, when we're aware of things, um, that's an element of consciousness. So we might use the term, I notice, right? I notice things around me, that there's some movement in front of me, that it's humid, that I'm outside, that it's noisy. These are things that, that you would notice, your perception, your sensory um, uh, organs would help you to perceive all of these aspects of the exterior world and, and the interior world. You know, in prior talks, we've talked about how our perception is not only external, it's also very much internal and, and both are tied, um, very important. Um, then an aspect of consciousness is what we call situational awareness, right? Where am I exactly? Um, I'm in a building. Uh, sorry, I think uh, I'm in a building. Um, I, uh, um, I'm not sure why that's happening, sorry. I don't know if is that a Zoom, Zoom pen or something like that. I don't know. It, I, it is. It is a Zoom feature. It's. It's part of the. Um, anyway, I'll continue talking. I'm, I'm trying to erase it if I can. I don't know. No, that's um, fine. Yeah, you can. You can just skip. So so. Um, so so basically, um, what we. Uh, I'm going to try to turn this off in in, in the meantime. I don't want to come up. Um, so one of the things we, we, we need to um, understand is, is that our level of awareness varies at times. We're, we're not always um, uh, you know, conscious of the same types of things. We're not always um, aware of everything around us. And the extent of the level of awareness that we have varies. So, so this, again, is, is one of the things about our consciousness that um, the depth of consciousness that we have. And again, each of these uh, bullet points that I'm uh, talking about have levels of depth behind them and also levels of, of expanse, breadth behind them. So um, situational awareness is, is, is also one of those. Um, let me try to close this. I can regain my mouse. Um, then we have we have something called, uh, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm calling understanding, and and I'm using the term local context. So when we understand things, we're understanding things that are around us right, in our periphery. Um, I'm not understanding what's happening on the sun right now. I'm not understanding what's happening in in Japan right now. I'm understanding what's happening in the room around me on, on the Zoom session in front of me. Um, so understanding of our local context. 
for example, um, you know, the realization that I'm in the Everglades now, um, I'm in a marsh and I saw a frog jump. That's a situational awareness and not just an awareness, but an understanding of the full context of where I am, right? Um, then we have um, a broader understanding of our entire existence, you might say. Um, so for example, in this example, I brought my children to experience and have fun with nature. So in this example, you know, you might just wake up and you might notice that there's movement in front of you, a frog is moving, it's humid outside, it's noisy. You might uh, have an awareness that you recognize things, you're outdoors, you saw a frog, maybe, you're not sure, but you thought, you know, you, you, as we go down these, these bullet points, we're having broader and broader sense of understanding of not only our consciousness, but of the world around us. And that's what one of the things that consciousness does is it gives us as it expands, as we have greater consciousness, you know, for example, as we grow older, um, you know, from a child to a teenager to, uh, you know, adult, um, these levels of consciousness also expand, or at least our ability to have these levels um, expands. These are all um, aspects. Um, this last point is, you know, um, something that I just wanted to, to expand on, the, on this one bullet. Um, and you might think of it as, as the maximum consciousness that at least as far as we know of all living things, of all um, beings that we are aware of, um, you know, we seem to have the maximum level. And we, what we notice is that it's not based on our immediate perception. The, um, the, uh, um, the maximum level of consciousness that we have is it actually uses our entire set of memories right, our, our um, absorbed experiences that we've had throughout life. Um, and it's much less about the immediate perception that we've had. Usually what, what it'll do is it'll incorporate the perception we had from a few minutes ago, which has given us a sense of reality. We'll talk about that later. And that helps us to, um, that, that integrates into our, our sense of consciousness, awareness at the moment. Um, also, when we're talking about this maximum type of consciousness, we're talking about um, not only our, our body and our local space, we're talking beyond that, right? Often we consider other people when we talk about the maximum set of consciousness. So when we're conscious about our existence um, in society, for example, we're on this planet we call Earth. We're thinking about others. We're thinking about the world, you know, the universe, maybe even God. So it's, it's beyond just us. It's no longer us. It also spans longer periods of time. It's not only this immediate moment. It, it talks about, you know, we may consider, uh, you know, the future, long periods of the future, you know, five years, 20 years, 50 years, maybe, um, or our entire life. Or we may think of it in terms of cosmic time, much, much broader, right? So, um, and also this level of, of self-existence, the, the highest level of consciousness, also is, is limited and in, in based on our mental effort and our mental ability. Um, it's quite difficult for all of us, um, but um, that's, that's one of the limitations we have as, as, you know, as, as humans. Um, now, there, there's some terms that we, we're aware of you know, in, in philosophy and, and some religions. We, there's this term called nirvana, right? And nirvana is actually one, a concept that's similar to, very much similar to the highest state of consciousness. It's, it's considered, an impossibility in, in a sense, but um, if you achieve it, you've achieved, you might say godhood or, or uh, you know, um, uh, this, this highest form of, of awareness and, and existence. Um, in psychology, Maslow, you know, um, he had his um, hierarchy of needs and, and the highest level that he described was self-actualization. And that's in a sense, um, another form of the highest level of consciousness when we talk about it that way. So there are different ways of looking at it. And these have, have existed for, you know, for centuries um, in human history. Um, so what we, again, when we're talking, just to summarize this one bullet, when we're talking about um, what, uh, you know, what, we're, what consciousness uh, involves, it involves um, being awake, it involves perception, it involves situational awareness, um, understanding, and it understands being within, within the world, within ourselves and the world. Um, so these are important concepts. Uh, next, we'll talk about when. When does consciousness 
exist, appear, you know, what, what the concepts around time of consciousness. So first we can talk about age. So consciousness, you know, it, it's especially the higher levels of consciousness that we talk about are likely not existent, non-existent before the first year of, of you know, the first birthday. You know, it's, it's gradually developing um, because if you think about an infant that's just born, um, their first experiences of this, you know, they were in a, in a you know, amniotic sac and warm, you know, fluid. They all of a sudden have got into this cold, cold world. It's the temperature is, you know, at least, uh, you know, in Fahrenheit, it's, it's about a 20 degree drop. Um, quite significant. If you went from temperature you're at right now to 20 degrees less, it would feel very chilly. Um, and that baby, when they experience this, they cry immediately. Um, but they're probably not aware of much else other than the temperature change, right? They, they're, 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 you know, for those of you who know, a, a child who's born doesn't have very clear vision. Their vision is very blurry. Their senses to some extent are developed, but they're still developing. Their audio sense, their sense of smell um, seem to be the most um, developed. And, and, and so they may rely on that, but there's not much awareness that they have. So, um, so again, uh, the sense of consciousness expands as we age, especially after the first, um, well, it expands a lot during the first year and it continues after that. Um, the level of consciousness and the, and the expanse of consciousness also is cyclical. Um, it naturally comes and goes. So for example, we have this, this day night cycle, you know, every, every evening, um, every night we go to sleep, we lose consciousness. That's intentional. That's how our mind works. That's how our biology works um during non-REM sleep but actually even within the uh when we're at night sleeping we actually come back to consciousness when we're dreaming and that's not really that's not the same type of consciousness but dreaming is a type of consciousness that's and we'll go into this when we talk about reality because that's i can explain it better there but dreaming is is all in our head it's not relying on um our sensory uh system we're not our eyes are closed and our brain has actually turned off almost everything in our body. So dreaming is almost completely entirely within, within our mind. Um, another thing is, is the, um, and also when we have anesthesia, that's another example when uh, you know, we, we can lo lose consciousness and then come back. Um, uh, you know, broad cases is when somebody goes into coma, that's, that's a severe case, it's very rare. And sometimes they do come out of it. Um, the third bullet here is, is about situation, the situational aspect of, of when consciousness um, expands or arises. And this is when our mind really has control. And this is after we've aged a bit, after usually age two or three, we can start to do this. Um, when our mind really requires us to observe something, to be attentive um, or to do something, then our level of consciousness can actually expand. We can make it expand intentionally. Um, we have we've learned that level of control and and again we have to remember that our, that our brain is doing this so our brain has learned how to control itself to expand its own level of consciousness okay so that's a sophisticated skill that we've learned um, you know within the first few years of life um, so our our need to be attentive attentive so an example here is is if you're and you know let's say you're you're sitting on on the subway um, you have your headphones on, you're listening to some music and you're reading a book um, and you're sitting by yourself, you know, you're sitting obviously with people around you in the subway, but um, you're reading in, by yourself and, and focusing on, on the book that you have. And the person sitting next to you might say something to you, but you don't hear it because what your mind has done is it's tuned everything out, the noise of the subway car, you know, you're focusing on your music and your thoughts and your reading and you've tuned everything else out. So the person that spoke something to you, they probably turned and faced you. Um, but your eyes didn't notice it, even your peripheral vision, your hearing definitely didn't notice it because your mind has tuned that out because you've made a decision early, earlier that there's nothing important in the subway car that, that needs my attention. So your brain has basically turned, made itself act in a simpler way. Um, it's using less energy. It has to do much less processing. It doesn't have to worry about all the sounds trying to figure out what the various conversations because that would be distracting. Um, but then when a person says something a second time, then your mind comes alert because there's a part of your mind that in a sense, you know, is aware, even though it isn't aware. Um, and then the second time that person says something to you, you become alert and you turn to them and you, and you first, you're not sure that you heard them. It's, it's almost as if 
you didn't hear them say it the second time, but you're aware something happened that got your attention. And then you ask them, did you say something? You turn down the volume and you, you start a conversation. Um, and that's an example of situational. And that happens all the time. There are many, many examples where we, where we do things like that. Um, interpersonal. So when we're, again, again uh, when we're, an interpersonal has to do with theory of mind. So we, we need to know, first of all, and this happens around the age of late three, early four years of age, um, that people other than us, even animals, you know, beings other than us, um, might have their own mind and their mind isn't the same as our mind. So prior to that age, um, a two-year-old actually thinks that everything inside their mind is commonly known to everyone else and nobody has other thoughts than them. So whatever they believe in, whatever they see is what everybody sees. And so when somebody disappears, um, when, you're, when you're playing peekaboo with a two-year-old child, they actually think the person disappears. And when you reappear, you know, they, 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 and also, you know, when, when, when their toy disappears, when they hide a toy, they think everyone else knows that because they've hidden it. They think that what their mind knows, everyone knows. So if they know that the toy is hidden, everyone knows the toy is hidden. They don't realize that a person who didn't see them hide the toy wouldn't be aware of that. And, and the, the, this is the concept of th theory of mind is that we have different separate minds and our minds can have separate thoughts. So the, after we have this awareness, the level of consciousness, the type of conscious, consciousness that we have can expand. And that's when we start to have awareness and interactions and interrelationships with other people and other beings, um, with our pets, with our parents, with our um, friends, uh, siblings, you know, teachers, everybody that is around us in our world, you know, I'm talking about a child, but this applies to, to adults also. Everyone in our world, we are um, interacting with them but we have to really know what they're aware of or what they're not aware of. We have to kind of, um, when we're communicating, we have to share things that we don't believe they have. So if we, if we want to say, say you know, if we want to tell them about what happened in school, right? We know they don't know what happened to us in school, but if they don't know the name of our teacher, then we can't simply say, um, you know, Miss Allen said this. Now, if a parent knows that we, you know, we use the term Miss Allen um, because Miss Allen would kind of give away. But if, if we say, you know, um, Allison said something that, that our parent might not know if we're referring to another student who is Allison or the teacher whose name is Allison. So we would have to know to tell our parent first that Allison is our teacher. So interpersonal communication requires us to have consciousness of the other person and the level of awareness that they have. Um, and the level, so lastly, the, the type of consciousness that we have, we all were, you know, while we're awake, while we're uh, awake, we are always conscious to some level, right? Um, even a child. Um, so if an infant might have, a, in, in their level of consciousness, they might have the perception that they have a funny feeling, which you know would be hunger in their tummy. They don't know it's hunger. They have no concept of hunger. They just have this concept of a funny feeling. Um, and if that funny feeling is uncomfortable, they might cry. And that's more of an uh, autonomic system that's not learned that they're born with, were born with. Um, or if they feel wetness, right? They, they wet their diaper, you know. Um, so these are, these are things that, that are a very rudimentary sense of consciousness. And for an adult, it would be more complicated. For example, I need to, to uh, what do I need uh, for next week's presentation? So if I'm doing a presentation next week and there are things that I need information, for example, what do I need? That's something that's a more sophisticated level of consciousness or a very sophisticated level of consciousness is, you know, for me to be content, do I need to have knowledge? Is knowledge a prerequisite for contentment? Or can somebody be content without knowledge? Um, that, that's a more higher level of, of consciousness. And that's where we're getting into the existential ideas that, that you know, we talk about in other, other talks here. Um, so uh, the, again, the, the conscious expanding, the, the when aspect of consciousness is that it expands, it's cyclical. Um, it's, it's geared around focus, focusing um, around the things that are important or unimportant. 
and, and a word here is a tune. Um, also, we do it for others, and then we do it for ourselves. Um, we, you know, uh, you know, our mind thinks of it as as myself because, you know, in a sense, where we're selfish in that sense. Um, next, where? Um, so this is actually a very complicated topic, which we're not going to go too much into tonight. This is something we'll we'll cover in a, in a future topic, but and there are many theories around this. The best evidence is that it's it's in several regions of the neocortex, um, mainly in the in the prefrontal cortex. And again, we talk about many levels of consciousness. So the lower levels of consciousness are, for example, they're, they're again scattered throughout the parts of the brain in the brain stem. So the the um, level of of awakeness that we have, um, the the pons, and, and there's a sub area of the pons which actually controls whether we're even conscious, awa awake or not, or whether we, we for example, if we bl black out, um, that's handled by that aspect. Uh, the basal ganglia, that, that gets a little more into um, other, you know, again, these are all the lower levels around perception things. And then the higher levels are primarily around the, the prefrontal cortex and the temporal lobe. Um, again, these, these are the neocortex areas. Um, lastly, the how aspect of consciousness. How does consciousness arise? And again, this is very, very complicated. This is an area that's act, area of active research. We're not going to talk about it tonight. Um, uh, but because what I want to do is I want to give everyone an understanding, that additional understanding that we need prior to delving into these more complex parts of, of this question. So we're going to go into some of the, the easier to, you know, the lower hanging fruit, so to speak. So, um, there's a simple model of consciousness that I'm going to present, okay? And so at, at the sim simplest sense, um, and again, it's, you know, at the beginning, we talked about this hierarchy of consciousness. So the simplest and, and most basic level of consciousness that we have is geared around our physical body and around our being awake or unconscious, either conscious or unconscious. Um, that's the simplest level. And the next level adds to it this concept of perception of the things around us nearby, but it's only limited to our perceptual ability. And our perceptual ability is quite limited because and, and I'm, what I'm talking about perception is not the more advanced levels of interpreting what we've perceived. I'm talking purely about pure perception. So for example, um, you know, if, if you, when you're just waking up, let, let's say you had surgery and you, and you came out of anesthesia, and you're kind of coming out of it and, and coming into awareness. One of the first things, I and mean, you'll be groggy, most likely. Um, and what will happen is that you'll, you'll kind of, you know, your eyes will kind of flutter open a few times. It, it, you won't really know where you are. You might have an image of, of the, the, you know, that you're in a hospital bed, um, but you won't really understand it. You won't even, it won't even register that you're in a hospital, but even though you see it. So that's the level of perception we're talking about here is that your brain is gathering the data, but it's not understanding the data yet. Okay, so the next level of perception is where you start to understand and make sense of that. Okay, the situation you're in. So as you as you come out of surgery, you know you're out of surgery. You're in the the post-operative room. Um, you know they let you rest and come out of the, your your you know have the anesthesia you wear off. So your perception is trying to build a sense of of the, your surroundings. You're you're hearing. We'll hear conversations nearby. Usually, they, they they have multiple people in the same room, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not. It, it might be one or two. People, there might be a nurse nearby, so you might hear some things. Um, you might see some things. Um, it'll be semi-private area. You might have a family member who's sitting by, you know, waiting for you to come out of it. And and so the situation that you're in, you slowly start to absorb and realize where you are, um, because while you were in surgery, you were totally unconscious and you had no awareness at all. And then you were moved while you were unconscious to a new location where you have no understanding where you where you ended up. So you have to gain this situational awareness. And then after that, you start to understand and you start to have a local context. You start to remember, okay? So you're relying on your memory that, oh, today is this day and I had surgery today. And now I came out of surgery and I'm probably in the, wait in, in, in the post-operative room and so now that's why I'm in this hospital bed. And you start to form a sense of, you start to play back the things that happened, you know, hours ago. Um, and you start to put together this picture of reality, which puts you in the exact situation where you are. And all of a sudden things start to make sense. And then that expands to a broader, your maximum 
content context of where you are. And then you have a full understanding of the reality, you might say. Okay. And, and this actually um, happens in stages. So one of the one of the things that this model helps us do is that there, there you might say different. So the proxy the, the distance from your physical body, um, as well as the amount of time from your physical body, as well as the emotional distance from your physical body, all of these five concepts that I have in the bullets are things that expand outward from your physical body. So when you're in the innermost lower, lowest level of consciousness, the distance from your body, your awareness of things is very limited to the very nearby things. You're not aware of things that are miles away. You're not even think, near, aware of things in the, in the same building in another room. You're, you're trying to figure things out that's right next to you or physically where you're, whether you're sitting or laying down or standing up, you know, these are the types of things, very, very near distances to your body. Um, in terms of time, you aren't thinking about two months later or even two months back, you're thinking about this exact moment, right? So the proximity to time is also very limited. And as your level of consciousness expands, so does the distance in time, okay? Both forward and backward expands outward also, okay? Um, same with emotional proximity to people and the world, right? So um, the P, you know, so it, as you came out of surgery, the proximity to people. So you might see your family member first, and that would be a close person. And then you might think of the surgeon that you met earlier, uh, and the nursing staff, because you met them a few hours ago, and you still rem remember them. And these people are the people that are closest to you physically. Um, but then as you grow more into fuller consciousness, you start to remember much more of your life, of your broader family and, and friends and er everything else will come into play. And a lot of this happens very, very quickly, but this happens in stages. The, these concentric circles kind of grow outward as our level of consciousness expands. And then the next stage is, is you know, it, it covers the, ex the expanse of our life. So in the beginning, you're not thinking of your entire life. You're not aware of your entire life. You're only thinking of a minute moment, this, this hour, this minute. And then eventually you start to realize this day, this day was a day of surgery and it expands outward into much more of your life. And the same thing around the things in the world, right? So you start to think about the things. So that immediately you think about this hospital bed, the physical bed that you're sitting in, there might be um, a, a glass of ginger ale or a can of ginger ale that the nurse put so, so that you, you, you might, if, you're, if you have a dryness in your throat, you can take a sip. Um, and so you'll notice that you might notice Again, your relative sitting um, on a chair, so you'll notice them. So all of the things, the objects in the physical world, you start to real to notice first the nearby things, and then things further, further, further outward. And all of these things are aspects of consciousness. So consciousness is a multi-dimensional thing. It's multi-spatial. It's multi-temporal. So all these things, each of these five things, are layers on. They they expand both in breadth and depth. So while this is a, you can think of this as spheres within spheres, but it's actually each of these spheres has these five things around them. So it's five spheres, it's, it's complicated, but anyway, the simple model, I think I drew it this way simply because it is, it is simpler to see and understand, but it, the ideas are that all of these things expand in, in very, very broad ways. So let's pause here, we can do some Q&A um, and uh, let me pause. Uh, let me pause for uh... All right, folks. So it's time for Q&A. You're welcome to ask uh, questions. At this point, let's focus only on questions, kind of clarificatory questions, uh, anything like that. The four rules for those who are uh, new here. I've been doing this meetups for five years, and these four rules have worked very well. Rule number one, Type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. And rule number four, feel free to speak your mind, disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. All right, so with that, um, go ahead and type in exclamation mark if you have questions. First up is going to be Claudio. Claudio, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. 
Yes, uh, regarding the highest sphere of consciousness, the uh, maximum consciousness, how does that differ from the lower spheres uh, structurally uh, regards to the neurons, uh, regard, uh, regarding the synapses, white matter and regions and so on? How does it differ? Uh, so that's something I didn't want to go into tonight because it is, well, first, we're not sure. We really don't know a lot of that. Um, I mean, there are some things we do know, but... Oops. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I muted you by oh, mistake. Sorry, I didn't realize. Okay, so I, I was sorry speaking. About that. Yes. Let, let me, so, so I didn't. That's something I didn't want to go into tonight because it is it is fairly complicated. Um, but uh, the so the level of consciousness expands as we age. So if we're talking about a, a, an infant, a lot of that would not have developed. The and 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 again, it's it's. Uh, the physical brain also develops over time. So one of the reasons why it, uh, the sophistication of consciousness doesn't develop in a child that quickly is because their physical brain hasn't developed that quickly. Um, so that's also one of the limitations that we have, that as our brain matures and develops physically, for example, a lot of the, the white matter um, is very limited in a, in a young brain. Um, and so there's, there's, lim phys there's physiological limitations on on what an uh, infant's brain is even capable of doing. Um, so the, and, and, and the, the extent of consciousness, so if we're talking about an adult, a lot of it we don't know. There are many theories around this. Um, this is not something I'm, I'm gonna talk about tonight, uh, but you know, we'll go more into this later on. So let, let, me, let me just pause here. Um, Sorry, I'm not, I, it's not something that, that I can go into. That's that's fine. Um, right uh, yes, that, that's fine. So folks, uh, you know, Sanjay has done more than almost a dozen meetups and we've covered many, 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 many topics. Uh, so I'm going to put the, I'm going to report the, uh, the link to the playlist. Uh, and I strongly suggest to go and uh, check them out. Uh, so next up is going to be Joe, Jyoti, Laura and Vanessa. Joe. Uh, hi, Sanjay. Um, uh, quick question. The idea that the distinctions between the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problem of consciousness. So what I'm uh, you know, gathering is that you've presented what the easy problem is essentially, right, is at, at its core. Uh, it's the walking, you know, the perception, the situational awareness that can be reduced uh, but there was the hard problem aspect of it as well. And would you have qualified that as something as like the state of nirvana or the self-actualization aspect of it? Or would you have a different definition of it uh, from, uh, you know, Chalmers perspective? Yeah, so, so I mean, the hard problem, so I did go into it, but I didn't use that those terminologies. So because, um, and I, in the previous talk that I did on conscious, I went into that more. That's why I didn't. I didn't want to repeat a lot of the same things. But the and, and that in that talk I did go more into the hard and tough problem of it. So I did cover it here. But in in the first um, set of bullets, where I was talking about maximal consciousness, the, the the as we went down into the list of bullets, let me see if I can pull that up again. Um, I'll do that as we speak. Um, the the um, the. Uh, the hard problem has to do with, you know, how how do we know how do how does our mind uh, become aware of its own level of consciousness? Okay, and it's it's an aspect of, of the last bullet that I discussed. I mean, I don't see I don't see the slide. Oh, here it is. Um, I'm gonna have to flip back, but anyway. Um, we we don't we don't have have um, so this this level the, the broader self act the one with arrow that's really talking about the hard problem of consciousness um, and and again you know I, I think I described it as, as nirvana and self actualization those are simple ways of looking at it but again this is not something I wanted to go into tonight. But um, and that's something that I'm again taking st stepping stones, you know, uh, to to reach. But um, yeah, it's not something we're going to go into tonight. Um, I don't know if if 
there's something you specifically wanted to ask, but you, you can uh, jump on the list again if, if I didn't answer your question. No, no, that, that's quite all right. I mean, the idea of self-awareness and you and self-existence that you included it in that bullet point. Okay. Thank you. Um, so folks, I mean, this is a very, very large topic. And we kind of, it's, and it's a, it's a field that is going through this golden age where every day new information is coming in. So the thing I like about uh, what Sanjay is doing is that what he's doing is that he's kind of breaking this entire massive area down into manageable chunks and taken together, they're painting a picture of kind of covering kind of major aspects of the field. So you get, uh, you know, get familiarity with it. So that's why we're kind of delimiting things. So feel free to ask the question. If it can't be answered, that's, that's fine. Actually, if you walk away with more questions, that's, that's the ideal situation. All right. So it's going to be Jyoti, Laura, Vanessa, uh, Stephen, um, Christopher, Franklin, and Mike. Jyoti. Sanjay, <clears throat> you said that you get up in the morning and you are conscious. What, what, what happens when the sleep is interrupted at night two or three times? And each time you wake up, you are very aware of what, what's going on. Yeah. Can, you under, can you make me understand the phenomena? Yeah, so actually sleep is, sleep is not as, as the way we think of it. We think of sleep as this monolithic homogeneous thing that we, we, we're awake, we fall asleep, and then we're awake in the morning. What happens is that, and, and uh, we, we, the period of sleep, as we transition from full awakeness into when we go, transition towards sleeping, sleeping is, is it's considered to have four stages right now. Okay, the, the, in the past we we described it as five stages, but with, right now um, you're going into the, the the first three stages are preliminary, where we're transitioning to deeper and deeper and deeper levels, and they're all non-REM sleep. Okay, non-REM meaning um, your mind is not doing anything. Your mind is basically turning itself off, okay, in a sense. Um, and not off, but it's, it's, it's minimizing activity. It's becoming calmer. Um, it's paralyzing your body. Um, and then the last step, that fourth step of sleep is what's called REM sleep. And that's when your mind, you know, um, uh, ironically, what it does is it becomes fully on. It turns on. And that's when we have dreams, the dream state. And there are valid reasons why it does that. Then what, the, what our mind does is it actually goes in reverse and goes from full REM sleep down out of REM back into, it doesn't come, we don't come completely out into consciousness, but we come close to it. We come to near levels of consciousness where if something happens at that moment, and that usually lasts a few minutes, then we'll probably get woken up. Um, and then again, we, we go back you know, through the stages into REM sleep and we dream again, and then we go out again. So this happens several times through the night. And this happens with every person, whether you remember your dreams or not, you are doing it. Every person does this, okay? Usually about three to four times uh, in, throughout the night, um, you will go th you know, into REM, out of REM, into, and then toward the morning, you'll finally exit all the way out into consciousness. So, you know, Jyoti, what you asked is that you wake up. So sometimes you may actually wake up when you when you leave REM back into this lucid state. And, and there's sleep is actually a very broad subject. People have lucid states, they have lucid dreams, there are many aspects of that. So depending on, on how your mind is, you may actually be in some of these states longer than others, or you may remain in some states rather than transition back and forth. So, it's a little complicated, but but you you will remember you you when you come back out to the um, least deep level of sleep, you may wake up momentarily, but you're going to be groggy. You may actually realize that you're you were sleeping. Uh, most of us don't, but sometimes some people do. So hopefully that answers what what you wanted to ask. Wonderful. Next up is going to be Laura. Laura, what's your question? Oh, well, not really. I just wanted to say, having had surgery last week, I went through every one of those stages that you described coming out of it, um, except for the last part where the situation is they start rushing you out. It's like time to get up, go. So it's just slightly different. 
Um, and I was going to ask something about dreams, but I think um, I'll wait till we get further into that discussion. Wonderful. Okay. We will have one more chance of uh, doing uh, Q and A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Next All up right. is going to be Vanessa, followed by Stephen. Vanessa. Now, Sanjay, are there possibly yet two different types of consciousness we're describing? One maybe more mechanical or physical contrast versus maybe practical what you can observe. Like for example, someone who suffered, let's say, a mild stroke may not be aware of their prior behaviors or personality, but you know their behavior may have altered, but they can still you know, mentally process and uh, you would call them conscious and may not even know they had a stroke, but like I said, maybe their memories impaired so they don't realize who they once were. Yeah, that, that's a very good good um, observation question. Um, if you ask that in the next session when we talk about reality, because the, the sense of reality a person has, they, what you're asking about is really the sense of reality that somebody who's had a stroke um, has. Their perception of reality may be distorted. So if you ask that again, I, I can raise it there. Thank you. Next up is going to be Stephen followed by Christopher. Stephen. Hello. Hi, Sanjay. Um, my question actually, does have to do with dreaming. So if you are gonna talk about this or have talked about it before, please let me know. Or if you could suggest a uh, book about it. You mentioned that dreaming is almost entirely in our brain and that we're unconscious when we're sleeping. But some people, I don't know if fraud in the interpretation of dreams mentioned that our dreams are a manifestation of our Latin consciousness. Uh, and from what I know, we don't actually know a lot about the brain, I mean, about dreaming. So how do you know that what dreaming is? So um, there, there have been a lot more um, research around dreaming. It's, it, so when we say we don't know, I mean, again, these, the, these topics, are not something where you know nothing about it and you know everything about it. Um, like the example that I gave with, with this notion of the simple model that I gave of consciousness where it's multidimensional, that's the same thing that happens with almost every area of comp the complex world. So when we talk about dreaming in this complex world, think of it as a massive three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, right? And there are many things that we filled in in this jigsaw puzzle it's three dimensional, so we can start to kind of get a shape around what it is. But there's enough that we don't know some parts, some parts we have pretty good understanding of. And the overall picture, we don't have a solid representation, but we're starting to see the outlines of the overall concept. So with that's the same with dreaming also, is that the overall concept of dreaming, we, we do understand in that what the brain is doing, it's primarily doing two things. It's resting, and it's also well, three things. It's resting, it's reorganizing, and it's repairing. Okay, three, those are the three things that it's doing. And reorganizing is, is a complex set of activities. Repairing is also, you know, it's actually an um, opportunity of the brain because our, our body has to repair itself as, as we live in. And there are many things that happen in the body. So these are three main things that, that happen during dreaming, during, during the nighttime period. And, and dreaming is one of those parts of it. Um, I'm not sure if, if that, uh, that address, I, I, think, I think I covered what, what you were asking. Yeah, but, but, but we will go into it in, in reality a little bit. We'll go briefly into it. I mean, Sanjay, tonight we're not, not talking about dreaming. Yeah, I, I recommend not doing follow-ups because there are so many people asking questions. And what will happen is that there is going to be one more opportunity for people to come back and do follow-ups. So at that point, uh, people can. So folks, uh, I strongly recommend this new technology of pen and paper. You can keep track of all your questions because what we're going to do is that we're going to also have a chance to go into breakout rooms to discuss amongst ourselves and then kind of come back with the next level of observations and questions. All right, next up is going to be Christopher, Franklin, Mike, Jack, and Marty. Christopher. Yeah, um, hi, Sanjay. Two quick questions that you could probably answer quickly for me, I guess. Um, do you think consciousness is synonymous with awareness? And do you think that all animals, not all living things, because I'm excluding plants in this, but all animals have at least a sense of consciousness? Okay, um, so the quick answer is that if you haven't seen the previous talk I did on consciousness, 
I went into all of that. I went to very much detail of those. Um, the quick answer, uh, awareness is not the only type of consciousness. So, uh, at the beginning, I talked about many, many levels of consciousness. Awareness is one of those levels. Um, and it's one of the earlier levels. Um, it's, or you might say it's more toward the intermediate, but but the, the other video that I talked about goes into that. As far as all animals, um, obviously it's, it's theoretically we can't know, but um, the lowest levels of animals, insects and, and you know, bacteria even, um, most likely don't have consciousness, what we would call consciousness, the, or the level of consciousness that they would have would be the lowest levels around perception, and just waking and, and not waking, right? Be, being, being, for example, when, when a spider, um, you know, freezes and plays dead, okay? We don't know whether it, it physically loses consciousness or not, or whether it even has consciousness, but that might be an analog to when it's playing dead, it might actually faint, you know, how, how we faint when, we, when we're, we get so terrified. So it's possible that, that there is some level of extremely simple consciousness in a spider that that you know crunches its body and and, and plays dead, um, versus one that's that's moving about. But but the previous uh, talk I did goes in, into into that more. Thank you. Uh, next up is Franklin, followed by Mike. Franklin. Uh, Franklin, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a two parter. It at what stage down the evolutionary tree does sleep behavior emerge? And at what stage down the evolutionary tree does dream behavior emerge? And then I would ask why, or what does that imply or something? Um, I don't know. I, that's not something I've studied, so I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mike. Mike, Jack, and Marty. Mike, what's your question? Mike, you need to unmute yourself. My question comes from uh, Isaac Asimov and from Descartes and from machine learning. Um, what uh, would a self-driving car work better if it was conscious? And that leads to the question, is a self-driving car already conscious? Okay. And that leads to the question, is our consciousness really the same as a self-driving car, except uh, our brain is made of meat rather than silicon and gallium arsenide? And, um, and the health and uh, awareness and safety is biased by the fact that we're made of meat. Now you're the balance of my time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Mike, you, you do this all the time. Um, you ask a very interesting, um, broad questions. Um, I, I mean, so one of the fir first things when we were asked, when you were asking the question um, came to my mind is that you were describing consciousness in specific ways. And consciousness is actually, again, as I said at the beginning, it's a very broad set of behaviors. So if you're talking about a self-driving car having consciousness, it would have only some of those, you know, it would not have all of those levels of behavior because most animals don't have all those levels of behavior. Um, it might have the lowest levels of behavior around perception, not even awareness. It would not be aware. Um, it would have perception of physical objects surrounding it. Um, and it would have perception of um, decisions that it needs to make, and that's about it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not. Again, consciousness is not one thing. Um, so, it's a self-driving car would have the the lowest level of consciousness, if if that even. I, I wouldn't even use the term consciousness. Thank you. Next up is going to be Jack, Marty, and Rogine. Jack. Yeah. Thanks for the for the information. This was really great. Um, I'm wondering, with all the talk that medical marijuana and marijuana is coming more and more into our culture, and, and what does drugs, marijuana, how, how does it affect our consciousness and what level, and do we then fluctuate between different levels of consciousness with it? Yeah. Anyway, that's my question. Thanks. So, so they, most um, hallucinogenic or, or uh, um, neuroactive uh, 
substances. It doesn't have to be just drugs, illegal or legal. Um, they, they affect many parts of our brain. They are they, they can and do affect our levels of consciousness. For example, anesthesia is a drug which affects our consciousness directly, right? It turns it off. Um, and and uh, I imagine, you know, many forms of opioids would do the same in, in high enough dosage. Um, the, the exact effects, so the initial effects of most of these drugs are more on our perception and our sense of reality. They tend to distort our perception and that distorts our understanding of the world. Um, and that is tied to our sense of consciousness, not, not the level of consciousness, tied to our sense of consciousness, it's tied to our self-awareness of how conscious we are and, and where we are in the world. It disrupts our understanding of the world. I don't know, I, I, I can't answer if it actually, I mean, it was, I, I did say some uh, drugs would affect our consciousness but you're talking about medical marijuana. I don't know if that would affect our consciousness in the same way, but definitely would, it, it would disrupt our, well, I don't even know if it disrupts our senses. I, I Marijuana, I don't know enough about to, to answer that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up is Marty followed by Rogene. Marty. Yeah, thank you. I, I love the model. Um, Marty, we can barely hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I love the model, uh, but the model assumes that the, 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 the core of the onion is working at 100%, let's say, in the second layer of the onion as well. What if on the first layer, for example, I have a lesion in the medulla oblongata, or in the second layer, I have a problem with lesions in the visual cortex. How does it impact your model? So, I mean, the, the model is not talking, is not, is not a model of the physical brain. It's a conceptual model of, of the levels of consciousness that our brain has. And so this, there's no parallel here between parts of our brain versus the model. Um, and your question does tie, tie parallels. Maybe I'm not understanding your question, but if, if, what, if you have lesions in one part of the brain versus the other parts of the brain, they could have impact on our level of consciousness or the type of consciousness or our sense of reality, similar to what drugs do in our brain. Um, because lesions basically cause disruption in activity, similar to what drugs can do. Um, it's, it's a very broad question. I don't know exactly how to, to answer it, but I, I, it's not something that, um, I mean, the model that I gave doesn't really, uh, it, it's not discussing specific areas of the brain it's 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 the model is assuming that the brain is working all of the areas of the brain that need to work to give us the full capability for you know that person at that age has um then that person's brain would full brain would be able to go through the different levels of consciousness depending on the circumstance they're in Right, but I, th I think I think the question was more: What if one of the layers malfunctions? Okay. Well, it's not that these layers correspond to an area of the brain, or or that these layers are. Uh, so, well, if 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 one of these layers, I'm trying to think of this as a hypothetically, if you lose the ability to transition into one of these layers, okay, I think that's probably what you're asking. Um, then you would be cut off from moving forward into higher levels. Most likely you would be cut off. It, again, it depends on, on how consciousness exists in the brain. I mean, the, the, the highest level of consciousness requires some of the lower lo levels, but it doesn't require all of them. For example, you can have, you can have um, self-actualization -actual without having perception, right? A person who is completely, um, let's say that they have memory somehow, Okay, uh, so in your example, let's say that the person has lived until age 25 and all of a sudden all of their senses were destroyed in a stroke um, or the regions of the brain that, that process sensory input are destroyed in a stroke through massive strokes and um, they lose the ability to have any sensations. So that layer is totally cut off. They st their brain would still function the rest of their brain would still function. They would be able to have memories of their past. They would still be able to think of themselves as 
being a human being in the larger context of the world, they would be able to have all of those, you know, I, I expect, um, they would be able to have all of those aspects we think of, of as at higher levels of consciousness, and they would be able to faint, which would mean go down to the lowest level. So, but, but they would lose the ability to go into that one level that, that you're talking about. So it's, it's difficult. I don't think there's one answer to the, to the question you're asking. It really depends on what happens in the brain. Thank you. Next up is Rojin followed by Ash. Rojin. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if this is the right time to ask how level of intelligence fits into this model. Um, yeah. And if it's not a good time to ask that, that's okay. I'm uh, guessing, no, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, um, this is fine. Yeah, I mean, the question is, is, is very valid. Um, good question. I, so I, I don't believe intelligence plays any role in this. So consciousness is, is irrespective of intelligence. So that's one of the reasons why, and, and we believe animals have less intelligence than, than, you know, or depending on how you approach intelligence, because again, intelligence is a broad topic. It has many aspects. It's not just one thing that we call intelligence. There are many um, slices to this thing that we call intelligence. So animals have different types and, and usually lesser um, breadth of intelligence than, than an adult would have, adult human would have. Um, I don't think it, it really comes to, into play. I think um, animals and, and children have uh, con the full breadth of consciousness. It's just that the complexity of the world that they can have and this gets more into the reality side of it that we'll go into next. That may be a little bit affected, but I don't think even intelligence would affect that too much. Intelligence is really the, the speed with which you can process things. That's, that's why one of the ways that I think of intelligence. Thank you. Next up is Ash. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so the, the model that you presented of consciousness uh, describes it as these expanding levels of uh, awareness that kind of in increasingly integrate a broader range across you know different dimensions spatially and temporarily, and that seems uh, really compelling. Um, but you also mentioned um, the issue of focus and attunement, and I'm just wondering if you might be able to say a bit more about how those work together. Because, um, like for example, just with visual perception, you know, we have a very narrow, limited uh, area of focused awareness, and you know, we have kind of broad uh, peripheral awareness, but it's very, very fuzzy. Um, and just in general, you know, there are these limits on what we, how much we can have in focused awareness at a time. So, I'm just sorry, it's a very general question, but I'm wondering if you might be able to expand a little bit on how uh, this issue of focus and attunement fits in, you know general awareness and, uh, you know, specific focused <laughs> attunement work together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the, in the model, when I, when I had, let me, let me try to bring that up as, as I speak. Um, what, what we, what we're um, talking about, if you remember that there was a yellow line that I had, let me try to um, bring it up first. So um, there was a yellow line that, that, um, So the concept of, of, of focus and attuning, and this yellow line is really under the control of our mind. We control this yellow line. This yellow line represents the level of focus that we want at that moment in time, at that moment in time, in space, around relationships, around the world. So if, and, and at, at the, in, in rare cases, we lose the ability to control that. For example, when we're just in surgery and things like that. But most of the time when we have reasonable levels of consciousness, what we consider human levels of consciousness, we can control this very, very actively. And so when we're sitting in the example I gave when you're sitting in a subway car reading your book, right, you would uh, shift your focus level to the level of perception only, okay? And you would tune out everything outside. So the situation that you're in, is dynamic, right? That subway car has lots of activity going on. The subway car is, is stopping at different stations. And to some level, your mind is keeping 
track of the station that you want to get off on and the station it might have stopped at. So at a very perceptual level, you are keeping aware of, or you might be counting the number of stations you, the subway car is, is going through, but mostly you're ignoring most of these outer levels. And you're focusing only on the inner level. Of, so you're mostly focusing on perception, your eye. And again, you're controlling it and, and you're, you're hearing because you're listening to, to music or, or some audio. Um, and you, you've changed your focus. You've attuned to only these inner two spheres, okay? Um, so that's what I mean by focus is that we have the ability to change this usually, you know, at will. Um, and we usually keep it as, you know, around the, not maximum, because most people don't go through life thinking about everything, right? We usually stay toward the, the fourth level, our local context. That's usually where we reside in the real world. The things immediately the 10 feet around us, because when we're, if we're walking or sitting, the, the immediate peripheral world around us is what's actively involved in us. Although at a conceptual level, the maximal context is always there in our mind. So for example, if we're sitting in a room in a meeting, let's say at work or in school, and we're talking to people, right? Um, in our mind, we still have the awareness, not only of physical, but also of time. So we might remember something that happened a few months back, right? With a different group of people, not the people we're talking to immediately in this room. Right. So that maximal context is always there available to us. So we'll shift from this immediate local context. Temporarily, we'll shift into a maximal context. Remember a conversation from three months back with a different person. Okay. Remember the details of it. Come back to the local context. Find the person. Look at them in their eyes. Make face-to-face -face contact. Raise the issue to that person. Describe the, the prior conversation with a different person. Give them a local context. So transfer the local context from your mind into that person's lo lo mind. So they have their conscious awareness, their conscious reality starts to match your conscious reality of a conversation a few months back. And then you continue the meeting. So that's an example of how we shift our focus and attunement regularly all the time across these five dimensions. Wonderful. So hopefully, hopefully that answered it. Uh, thank you. Um, so we'll take one last question from uh, David, and then we will uh, continue with the second part. It's about uh, 10 o'clock. So I, I, what I propose, uh, Sanjay, let's do the second part and Q&A, and then we'll do the dis uh, breakout rooms at the end. Okay. Uh, all right, David, your question. Yeah, it's, it's sort of um, a question where certain things fit into the model. There may be two or three things, like how do they fit in? One is, uh, is there any consideration for the size of working memory in, in what is being handled by these processes? Uh, because the number of things that can be handled may not only relate to intelligence, but what can be built as conceptual structures. So the second question is, the complexity of a conceptual structure is pretty critical to what we uh, use to assess how an animal behaves, right? So I don't, I don't know how that's reflected in the, the model per se, because these, these levels can exist in very primitive uh, uh, ways. And so those, that's kind of one question. The second one is, uh, is there a f some measurement or faculty or representation in this uh, system of the continuity of memories? And because that's the reality of the system, how much it connects prior states to the current state and there's a, a unification of those because that's what we really mean by consciousness is that unity. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, memory is something that, that I, I raised earlier um, and it's always there, but memory is not something that's necessarily a part of consciousness. It's a part of our reality. Okay, so we'll get into that a little bit, um, but it's not, it's not necessarily a part of our consciousness. Now, our consciousness relies on, okay, it draws from Actually, I wouldn't say consciousness itself draws from memory, but um, aspects of conscious, aspects of realization um, can be affected by memories that we've had. But memory is, is part of this. And it, it, again, this model has, there's nothing tie, tying this model. This model is not um, characterizing any physical aspect of the, of the brain. The brain has memory, and what, again, we're, you know, we're talking about a brain of various ages. So whatever age this brain, this person is at, or even if it's an animal's brain, right? Animals' brains also have consciousness. Um, so 
irrespective of the type of being that it is and what age they are and the level of intelligence, sophistication, knowledge, memory, it doesn't matter because whatever that is, whatever stage of existence they're in, they can move across these planes of consciousness. And probably they, if, depending on, on the type of being they are, they might not be able to reach to the highest level of the consciousness. Okay? There are some limitations because the brain may not have developed that far. Um, so the highest level is a reserve to adult humans typically. Um, you know, with a normally functioning brain. So the memory is not something that's, in, I don't believe is intrinsic to consciousness, consciousness, but it is intrinsic to, to our sense of reality, which is something we're going to go into next. Wonderful. And I'll tie, I'll tie reality and consciousness together, so. Excellent. So with that, let's go to the part two. Uh, then, then folks, we'll have time to do one more round of Q&A, uh, Q and, and then we'll do breakout rooms. Go ahead, okay. All right, so let me um, get back to, okay. So we'll, we'll talk about reality next. Um, and, and again, it's, uh, we're gonna, so first before we do that, I wanna do a thought experiment first, okay? Because in a later slide, I'm gonna go into this a little more. There's two, two thought experiments that, that I want everyone to do. And they're fairly simple, it'll take not even a minute. Um, first, I want everybody to close their eyes and imagine, try to imagine your face with your eyes closed. That's it. And try to imagine the details, the types of things that you're, you're seeing in this image that you have of, of, of your own face. Um, if you want to take notes, if you have pen and paper nearby, um, that's okay to do. Um, but think about the details, think about the structures, uh, anything that, that comes to, to mind, you know, that you see when you're seeing, imagining your face. Okay, does anyone need more time? Okay, if anyone needs more time to speak up, um, but otherwise we'll move to the next one. Um, so the next one is, um, imagine that you're floating above yourself. So again, close your eyes and imagine that you're floating above yourself and you're looking at the top of your head or the back of your head. You know, Imagine uh, that you're looking from the ceiling down at yourself. And again, jot down any notes that you have, any thoughts, you know, what, what you see, what you perceive, um, what your, uh, you know, the level of detail that you're, you're seeing exactly, uh, you know, the things around you. This, this should be with your eyes closed. Okay, um, so hopefully everyone's done that. So let's move on. Let's go to the next, does anyone need any more time? Okay, so we'll go, uh, so we'll talk about reality. And again, reality has, and again, we, we, we wanna talk about um, different aspects of reality. So there's, uh, there's a, and this is something that's, that's not, we don't think of it often we don't think that we have it but there are moments when we don't have reality we don't have a sense of reality um for example when we fainted or you know when we're under anesthesia when we're in non-rem sleep most people at least um even when when somebody's in a coma it's believed or certain types of coma states it's not all types of coma states um so there are moments there are times when we have no sense of reality when reality does not exist in our mind okay um, another sense, another time is when we have, when we're dreaming and dreaming is not reality because dreaming is what I call fragmented reality. It's not really 
the true reality, okay, what it's constructed of it is prior events, prior memories, things that your mind had in the past that's putting together and piecing into this dream sequence or this dream um, images, uh, you know. So dreaming is not reality, okay? Dreaming is almost an opposite. It's not opposite, but it's, but it's pieces of prior reality, you might say, okay? Um, then we have another type of reality, which we might say intermediate or waking. And again, this is when we're uh, waking up from a uh, night's sleep or after uh, after sur you know surgery, an example. Um, and again, it emerges slowly. There may be grogginess, there may be disorientation. And again, it's it's not a um, a full sense of reality. It's an emerging sense of reality. Okay. Um, and then we have this sense of perceptual reality where we start to actually perceive, you know, using our senses. And, and our eye is our most active sense. I mean, our, our eye actually, our, our occipital lobe is, is almost a third of the size of our brain. It's, it's a massive, massive region of our brain. Um, and that's why our visual system is so important to us. We, we see the world mostly. Um, our skin is full of many sensors that we don't use as much. Um, yet physically on our body, it takes up much more space um, and, and energy than our eyes do. But, but And even in our brain, um, it takes much less space than, than the regions, the occipital region that our, that our eye requires for processing. So perception is really important to us. Um, and a visual perception is especially important to us. But when we perceive, we only perceive things. So in terms of reality, there's a level of reality where we only perceive things, but we don't understand things. And the prior example I gave, I talked about this. Um, and there are examples of this where, for example, we might have illusions, optical illusions, audio illusions, even tactile illusions, okay? Um, and these are examples where we have perception, but we don't have an understanding. Um, other situations would be where we're confused. And illusions can confuse you, but there are actually other states where, and, and this, these may be due to illness, it may be due to other issues, it may be due to, for example, a person who had stroke, but they can, there can be confusion around only the perceptual aspect of perception, non-interpretation of perception. Um, and also there can be sensory distortions. So these are all aspects of perception that affect reality. And again, this is, uh, again, you might think of this as layers of onions, if it'll help. Um, then we have this thing where we're situationally aware, when we start to form an understanding of, based on our senses, we start to form an understanding of the world around us. We start to see the physical objects and people. We start to recognize them. And we start to construct and update this thing that we call reality. Okay, so reality is a meta state, right? It's a state of the universe around us. And it can also be a state of the world inside of us. Um, and we have to create the state, this, this awareness, uh, this understanding. And again, understanding is the key word here, okay? Um, we have to form this, we have to construct it and update it in a regularity. Then we have uh, this local context again. And this is what we believe, what we consider is all around us, what's actually uh, behind us, what is happening nearby. You know, if you hear the audio, what sounds like a siren, okay, that gives you a contextual understanding that there is a emergency vehicle somewhere nearby traveling that that siren is coming from. Um, you don't see the emergency vehicle, you only hear it but that specific type of audio, and in some cases, the audio may even tell you whether it's an ambulance or a fire engine or a police car, because they have different types of audio. So the understanding of a reality gets more richer and broader. Um, and lastly, the global context. And this is where, you know, and, and David asked about memory and other people asked about that. So memory tends to come into play, especially toward the latter stages. Um, now, memory does play at the earlier stages. For example, perception does rely on memory, but it doesn't rely on what most people think of as memory. Perception, the types of memory that perception relies on 
are very, very low level. They're learned and they're recorded. They're, they're, our brain gets programmed. For example, when we learn, in our infancy, we learn to hear a specific language, right? We learn the phonemes and we learn the sounds of a language. We learn to differentiate between what are the gaps between the words. When we're hearing audio, a person speaking a language, we hear not only the words, but we hear the gaps. But if we hear a person in a different language that we have never heard before, or we don't, aren't familiar with, we won't hear gaps. It'll sound like a discontinuous tone of audio, and we won't know where the gaps are, the in-between are, and where the words are. And that's an example of memory that's perceptual. That, that's not something that we have to actively think about and remember that's automatically stored in our mind because it's learned early in our life when we were learning our primary language. And when we learn a language later in life, that actually has to be learned. Our hearing system, for example, learns to recognize the gaps in speech so that it can break up and recognize what's a word and what's a sentence and what's a question and these types of things. Um, so memory exists at all these levels, but most people don't think of memory in that complex way. Memory exists in many ways. Um, but the typical version of memory that people think of definitely occur at the lowest levels of the local context and the global context, even the situational awareness, you have to have some level of memory, memory to understand that. When you're, when you're in a marsh, you have to understand what a marsh looks like, right? And you have to have an awareness of, of what a marsh is. Um, if you have to have a situational awareness that you're sitting in a boat in the middle of a marsh in Florida, right? So situational awareness also would require memory. Um, so, so when we talk about um, the what aspect of reality, we construct our reality using whatever our senses give us. Now that whatever is in quotes, but it's actually very important because what that says is that it doesn't matter what sense, what senses we have or in a sense, in, in a, this is something that's, that's actually a little bit um, unusual to think about because most people don't think about this, but if, excuse me, if we are born with entirely different senses, for example, if a person is born, let's say they're born with the um, echolocation capability that bats have, okay? Let's say for whatever reason, a person is born that way with the ability to echolocate, okay? And their sense of hearing and their sense of speech is different from what humans have. It's more akin to what a bat has, let's say, okay? That person would have no difficulty acclimating to the human world they would still be able to function the human world except their speech because they don't have the ability to speak the way that we do. They would still try to communicate, but, and they probably will not move their lips, but they would communicate in other ways. Um, and they would still use all of their faculties, their sensory faculties to the maximal level and their brain will learn to use it to the maximal level that it, that it can to allow them to interact with the people around them. So for example, if a person is born deaf, right? They learn to communicate without sound, right? They learn to read lips um, without being taught. You know, if, if they if they have a congenital defect, a person who is born deaf will learn to, to lip read. If, you know, they'll, they'll need some training because learning the languages, they'll have to be taught words and, and concepts, you know, at early age using some other method. But it is, if, if they already understand our language, they can learn to lip read quite easily. Um, you know, it takes some effort, but but it, you know, time, but but they, it, it, the brain does it autom you know, almost automatically. So it doesn't matter what senses we're born with, and and I'm not going to go into this too much. But if if people have questions, I can elaborate a little more. But but this is something that's very powerful. This gives us this is actually an area of neuroplasticity that is extremely powerful. Okay, and it allows us, for example, if a person is is born with any kind of defect or with any kind of augmented ability. Or in the future, if we modify our genetic code to give us newer abilities, newer skills, or newer sensors, let's say, you know, I think Mike asked the question about AI. Um, if we, in the future, um, change our DNA so that we actually have, we don't even have to rely on, on um, you know, silicone and germani uh, germanium type, you know, uh, art artificial um, chemical uh, AI, we can actually create AI using the same uh, genome that we have in a sense, we can augment ourselves 
if we do that, our brain will adapt to it. Our brain can do it. So, so this, and this is the reason why evolution works because evolution allows that to happen. We, as we've gone through evolution, our brain has actually developed new sensory modalities. For example, lower animals, um, uh, very, very low animals don't have complex vision. Okay? And so complex vision became more elaborate through evolution and the brain adapted and expanded its capabilities, its abilities based on what the, um, you know, the more sophisticated eye could do. And actually it's not one-sided, it's both. The brain and the eye, they had to develop together in evolution. It's a co-evolution that, that allowed both of them to expand their ability together. Um, also, we're talking about uh, the what aspect of reality, the details that we construct, the granularity and the locality that we need um, to have. So for example, if we're born with um, uh, stigmatism and, and the uh, distance that our eye can focus is limited by that, um, our brain will adjust to it. Our brain doesn't care that our eye is slightly different from other people's eyes. Our brain still works and it makes sense of the world using that. Um, and then when you have eye surgery or when you put on corrective glasses or contact lenses, your brain over time learns to retrain itself to, to do that. So the details of granularity, the locality, all of these things um, is, a, is used to form our reality and our brain is constantly adapting to that. The last point on this is that we construct, almost concoct parts of our reality, okay? Um, and this is something we'll go into in a minute, but before that, what I wanna do is let's go back to the thought experiment we did, okay? So I wanna, I wanna go into that right now. So we, we did two things, we, we thought about um, we imagined our face, and the second thought experiment was we imagined the top of our head, right? So when we were imagining our face, and again, remember that when we're imagining something, I, I asked everyone to close their eyes and imagine. So you were not using your um, perceptual system. What you were using was your memory to imagine, right? Because when we live, our brain records lots and lots of things. So likely throughout your life, you've been in front of a mirror um, or reflective surfaces where you've seen your own face and your mind has recorded that. So the ability to imagine your face relies on that memory. But one of the things that you might have noticed and, and you know, depending on, the, on the, you know, what you, the types of notes you took, I suspect that the image that you imagined with your face was not extreme detail as if you're looking in a mirror, right? That it it kind of had certain aspects of yourself, but not full detail. And that's because the sense of reality that we have, the sense of memory that we have of reality is not a full detailed memory. Our memory, and this is in the normal person, okay? There are savants who have exceptionally detailed memories and they can, their memories record to the minus detail. But most people who don't have that ability, their memories can't, uh, don't record these sophisticated extreme levels of detail that our visual system has, or parts of our visual, our visual system doesn't have actually uh, global extreme detail. So the imagine, imagined version of our face was a representational face. It had characteristics of us. It didn't have, it didn't, it wouldn't look like us. If you drew based on your imagined sense face, it wouldn't look anything like you it would probably be a very, very rough, extremely rough, depending on your artistic skill. But let's say you're a good artist. It, even then, it would be a very, very rough image of your face because we don't remember all of the nuances of our face. It might actually be a memory of you from the past, from let's say a year or two ago. It might not be your face today. Or it might not be, you know, if you change your, your something, you know, you grew a beard or something, you know, it might not uh, capture that. So the imagined version of our face um, is constructed out of all of the memories of our past, especially of our recent past. So this is, this is one of the aspects that I wanted to highlight is that our reality of something as, as familiar to us, our face is the most familiar thing to us, okay? Our body is the most familiar thing we know of. Um, yet, our representation of ourselves inside our brain is not that detailed. And that forms the basis of how and why our entire reality is not that detailed and it's constructed, okay? Um, the second thought experiment was imagining the top of your head. Now, 
I suspect most of us have never physically seen the top of our head, unless you had this contraption of a mirror that allowed you to do it, you know, even then you would only see a snippet of it. You wouldn't be able to see your entire head and shoulder, et cetera, everything like that, as if you're floating in space above yourself. Okay. You've, we've never had that experience unless you had a camera or something, or you have a, some, you know, unusual contraption that lets you do that. Most of us haven't yet. Most of us were able to imagine in, in some sense, the top of our head, even though we've never or likely never seen enough detail around it. So this is a version of concocting parts of our reality. So even though we've seen enough versions of our body from different angles and mirrors and different things, we can still concoct something we've never seen. So this is the reason why if, if somebody asks you to imagine the surface of the moon, okay, even before we had actually traveled to the moon, science fiction writers and, and Jules Verne and many people had actually drawn the surface of the moon using either telescopes, but sometimes just using their imagination. Uh, because that's something that's that's powerful. And that's actually something we do all the time. We imagine many, many things, even things that we're intimately connected and familiar with. Um, so let's go to the part about um, concocting parts of reality. Okay, So here I have an optical illusion. Okay, And many of you may be familiar with it. So actually, let me... So one of the things I want to point to here is that next to the cylinder, there's there are two... Um, uh, rectangles. So th this is a grid of two um, types of rectangles that seem to be uh, different colors. Now, I chose this image specifically because th there's a grid uh, rectangle here that's labeled A, another one that's labeled B. And there's a connecting line that connects it to, to show you that they're actually the same color. Okay, A and B rectangles are exactly the same color. Okay, does everyone see that? Does anyone think it's a different color? If your monitor or your computer is, is doing something that, you know, that, that may well cause that, but hopefully you see it's the same color. A and B look the same color. Now I'm going to move this so it obscures that. And after a few seconds, what's going to happen is the cube for A and cube for B is actually going to appear to be different colors to you. This happens to everyone, okay? A seems to be darker than B, okay? It does, is, is there anyone who, who doesn't see that to, to, who, who, for them, whom A and B appear the same color, the same shade of gray? You can unmute yourself if you, if you see that or, or put an exclamation mark. I suspect no one does, right? This is an example. So let me, let me uh, so I'm going to move it so that it's partly halfway there. So now we can see part of that line that's connecting, okay? And now you have this slight sense where the extreme, the lower part of B seems to be lighter than the upper part of B, right? It's almost like that line that's connecting is kind of, you know, shifting our, our perception of, of the color of A and B. And let me move it back, okay? Right, and after a few seconds, you're going to see that A and B will look different again. They won't be the same color. And then we're going to move it completely off and it's the same, a and B. Now I'm not doing anything with, with the color here. I'm only moving this, this little smiley face to obscure this area, which is the critical part that your brain needs. Okay. Now the aspect of this of this optical illusion, sorry, the op aspect of the optical illusion is that what you'll notice is that this green cylinder is casting a shadow over a part of this. Okay, there's a shadow over this area. And the B rectangle or the B square falls directly in the shadow. And our visual system, our visual cortex has learned through years. So this will happen to a child who's probably one year or two years old, um, but not to a child who's, who's you know, a month old. But um, we suspect, we, you know, this is something very difficult to do in children that, that you know, research in children that age. But um, because your brain has learned to process shadows differently, your brain automatically changes the perception. Okay, so your eye is sensing that A and B, your eye, your retina is actually getting the exact same signal for the for the uh, block block A and block B. Okay, and that same signal is going into the initial processing parts of our brain. Um, but as our brain processes part this image and the processing gets further, and, and our our, our visual processing goes through about five layers. 
Okay. Um, and then there are some additional layers in, in the more uh, elaborate la ladder sections. As it goes through the, in the first one or two layers, A and B would be identical. Your brain would recognize A and B as identical. As it gets into the third and fourth layer, it would start to incorporate the shadow and it would start to realize that the shadow is important and therefore this A and B needs to be different. And your brain would, would modify the interpretation of the color, which is really the same color, okay? But your brain modifies it, it forces itself to imagine A is different than B because of the shadow, okay? Your brain changes reality. It concocts reality to fit a norm that it believes. Now, a few years ago, some of you may remember, there was a, there was a famous dress, the golden blue dress, right? I don't know if people remember this. That dress image is based on the exact same concept, okay? Um, it's based on contrast, though not, not, not shadow, but it's based on contrast. Um, and and there, were, there was a lot of research done around that, and there, a tremendous amount of research in the neurosciences. And we've learned a lot since then based on that one image. It was a very interesting set of episodes. But what we learned is that, um, and it helped us understand better around visual processing, because the actual image um, I don't remember the exact, I think it had, the, the image was actually um, a brownish type of tint uh, that many people, the average person processed as gold. Anyway, I, I don't want to go into too much, but, but th this, this concept around our brain actually changes reality, okay, based on what it thinks reality should be. Our brain, when it thinks reality is wrong or when it thinks that our, our senses, our eye is making a mistake, it changes it for us. Okay, so that's one sense. Um, and, uh, there's another um, optical illusion that I'm, I'm going to use. And in this optical illusion, most people have this sense that there is an invisible triangle that forms between these three black circles, right? And in reality, there's no invisible triangle there. The only reason why we imagine there to be an upside down triangle there, and we, we all see the right the ver vertical, the uh, upright triangle with apex on top. We see that even though there are gaps in, in between. And that also is, is part of the illusion is that these, inter these missing gaps in, in the line is not necessary. We see a triangle even though there's gaps in it. But what's more striking is that this invisible triangle is made up of negative space. Yet because these slices that of these pie shaped slices that are cut out of these three black disks that's all that we need to create this invisible inverted triangle. Our brain creates this invertible inverted triangle. It does not exist there. Okay. If I now I wasn't able to do this, but but if we could rotate these three black discs so that these pies face different directions, this invisible triangle would disappear. The the white triangle, it would disappear. Okay, because it doesn't really exist. Our brain creates it because our brain has learned to perceive these corners as corners of a triangle, and it fills in these gaps as lines. We, we almost imagine these lines being here, the, the sides of this triangle being lines. And, and that's, again, a pure concoction of our mind. So th these are simple things to show, but, but you know, if you're in the desert and you see you know, a mirage, that's something where our mind that's a more drastic that, that may be based on if you're if you're hallucinating but hallucinations are actually concoctions also because if you're a dream if you if you need water if you need something or if you're suffering heat stroke your brain is being affected in negative ways but even if you're not suffering ill your brain can actually uh, create reality that you want to be there because you want there to be this mirage of a something there um, the when aspect of reality again. So this is this is similar that as we grow older, we have more sensory prowess and we're able to to build more complex um, representations of the world. This is something that should not surprise anyone, because a child's version of the world is quite simple. Sorry, um, it's quite simple. Um, if you tell them about Santa Claus and you tell them Santa Claus flies in a sleigh. Um, he goes around the world in a single, not even a single, within a few hours, 
all around the world because they don't have a sense of how large the earth is. They don't have a sense that Santa Claus can't fit through a chimney. They don't have a sense of how can Santa Claus get this giant bag of gifts and himself through a chimney and not have any soot, you know, et cetera. These are all sensitive reality. So a child fits, forces their sense of reality based on what they're told or what they perceive, what their senses give them or what other people give them. And, and age is, is important here. Again, situational. So when our mind requires us to update or to even fully reconstruct reality, it will do that. So after sleep, after confusion, after a mental conflict, um, after stresses, illnesses, after stroke, for example, after an internal crisis. There are many, many situations that happen where our mind needs us to look at something, to relook at, at uh, reality. So, for example, if you're on the subway and you notice you're, you're, keep, you're not keeping track actively of the stops that the train is going through, okay? But in some sense, you kind of know because what your mind does is situationally, it expands its awareness for a fraction of a second every time the subway train stops, or it might actually do it. it your mind, our mind can do it many different ways. It might fractionally be keeping track of the number of times that the train has stopped at a station. If you're familiar with the, with the, trans, the, the subway map system, and you know exactly how many stops you have to pass through before you get off the train. But if you don't, if you don't, if you're in a new city in a new subway, then your mind will do it in a different way. It might actually, you might actually momentarily take a very rapid glance to look at, or if it's an entirely new subway system that you don't know, you might actually look for for a few seconds the name of the subway station where you're, where you're, uh, where the train is stopped, and then you resume back. So the situational updating of reality. Um, is something we can control and we change again, similar to how we do with consciousness and focus. We do this all the time. We, we build our sense of reality up and down all the time. And lastly, the sense of reality, whenever we're awake, we are always keeping it up to date. Um, in infancy, you know, you hear mommy come, you know, makes you happy, you're, you're, you're comfortable again because mommy or daddy is nearby. Um, you smell something that, that smells good, that's familiar. Um, these are things that, that are sensory, um, but they update our sense of reality. That if you smell something yummy, maybe it's time to eat. Maybe you know you may, it might start salivating at that time. As an adult, you know you might think of um, you know when do I step forward to board that metro? Right. If you're going to get onto that train, you have to know when to step forward. If you step forward too early, you might jump onto the tracks by fall onto the tracks by mistake, and that's not going to be good. So you have to be aware of the train as it's oncoming. You have to be aware of when you can start. You have, you might even have to be aware of people around you so that you don't get pushed accidentally at the wrong time. So these are all things that you're aware of. And again, your sense of reality is something you're forming and attuning based on your need. Um, as the train is starting to approach the station, as rapidly moving, your sense of reality is urgent. So you will become hyper vigilant to make sure that you don't fall onto the tracks just as the train is coming in front of you, right? Because nobody wants to die that way. So, um, but once the train is stopped, you stop doing that. Then your focus is on finding the door and when does the door open? And then how do you get inside? Um, things like that. Or, you know, if you're not actually boarding the train, maybe you're meeting someone and you're going to be leave together. So you might be looking for that person to exit the train. So depending on your situation, um, you're going to, the, the level of detail that you're looking for is going to change. Um, so, as we age, we, you know, we, we, we change our sense of reality. When we must know the level of information that we need to know, that affects it. When we need to resolve conflicts, that affects our, our uh, ability to form uh, reality and the depth that we form reality with. And the more complex representations of reality are become available as we age. Now, all of these things also have to do with memory. We, you know, we talked about memory and we talked about illnesses. Somebody asked about stroke. Um, so these are things that, that are based around our sense of reality that if you don't, if your memory is somehow affected either by stroke or some other way um, or a drug that you've taken, um, then the extent of reality that you're aware of will shift, will decrease probably. Um, or actually it can even expand the index. For example, 
there are hallucinogenic drugs, LSD and, and uh, you know, uh, I think, what is it? Um, ecstasy is supposed to do that. All the types of drugs that, that um, seemingly expand our sense of reality. And they also um, blur the distinction between our senses where we start to have something called synesthesia, where you start to have cross information between your senses. So the sense of reality is very dynamic and it can be adjusted or it can be affected in many, many ways, definitely by drugs, but even by ourselves within ourselves. And it's, it's actually an aspect of our, of our age. Uh, and as, as we become uh, senior, you know, people when they become uh, very, very senior and they start to get dementia or they might, you know, used to be called senility, um, Alzheimer's or different various illnesses of aging, um, some of these aspects will become more difficult and memory also, be, and, and again, there's a time because as our memory gets affected, it will affect our sense of reality and our sense of awareness and our sense of even consciousness. So these are things that, that um, uh, you know, affect our reality and consciousness. So let, let I think, Srinath Kanta, we want to do Q&A and then we'll, we'll do the, we'll, I'll have the closing slides and let, then we can let, break out let, or. Let, let's do one thing. Um, I think it's a long presentation. So uh, let's give just a short breakout room for 10 minutes for people to discuss these. And folks, when you come back, you can ask, uh, you can do two things. You can talk about what you got from the presentation very briefly, and you can ask a question. All right. And then uh, when we come back, we can do the, the closing slides uh, as well before before everybody starts to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't have too many closing slides. So yeah, we can do that quickly. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So folks, I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. The room, rooms are going to last only for 10 minutes and then automatically you'll come back into this main room. Okay. In the breakout rooms, give a chance for everybody to talk about what, what they got, like maybe one or two minutes. So briefly and just exchange some comments uh, and then come back with your takeaways and your questions. Starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back folks, welcome back. All right, so it's time for the next stage, which is going to be takeaways and questions. So you're welcome to, be, to give a brief takeaway on what You've learned so far, uh, 30 seconds, maximum one minute, and you are welcome to ask a question on the second part. So if you would like to do that, just go ahead and type exclamation mark as always. Keep on topic, be brief and be courteous. Who would like to go first? Joe. Um, we had a really interesting discussion uh, in our breakout room. Um, I'm just taking away, you know, better understanding of consciousness, but I do have like a very odd basic question. Mm -hmm. And it is odd is that can hallucinogens be used or um, to treat people that have a stroke, like hallucinogenics? So um, basically, a stroke is when a part of the brain loses um, access to uh, blood mm -hmm. um, and there's damage to neural tissue. Um, and depending on where in the brain that damage occurs, different aspects of your function would be affected. Um, and also depends on the severity of the stroke. Uh, so if hallucinogenics might, so, what hallucinogenics seem to do, and it's again, we don't even know that uh, in detail, everything that they do, but they seem to um, change how specific neurotransmitters, the prevalence and the affinity of specific neurotransmitters um, across uh, the binding sites throughout our brain. And what, what that does is it makes signals flow in more sophisticated ways than they normally do, either faster or, or longer distance or more broadly or more pervasively. Um, so if a stroke has, has destroyed areas of the brain that are important, it might be possible to use, though I don't think it's as simple as just you give them hallucinogenic and it'll do this. You have to do hallucinogenic, but also you have to 
teach them. It'll have to be part of the therapy program where you're teaching, you're using the hallucinogenic to guide them to use a specific new area of their brain to train it to take over the lost functions. Um, so probably you can do it, but but it's I, mean, I don't know if this has been if there are experiments that have been tried this with this. It might be possible, but you know it's it's very difficult to say. Great. I, I think probably it, it will be possible to some level. Uh, thank again, you. It, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Sanjay. May I complete your thought? Just, I was going to say. So um, I mean it, but at the same time, it might be that you can do that without hallucinogenics too, because that's that's basically what we do with uh, when it, with stroke patients is is we try to have them retrain uh, the lost function to a new part of the brain. But hallucinogenics might speed it up. We don't know. Thank you. Next up is going to be Kevin, Judith, Mike, and Vanessa. Kevin. Yes, thank you, Sanka. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, my question regarding to when you let us uh, close the eye. Uh, Kevin, can you speak uh, into the mic, please? Yeah. When uh, you do like, uh, experiment, uh, close eye, imagine my face. I also imagine that uh, your, your module, the conscious, a uh, simple module. So, What's my reality related to the conscious? This consciousness also drive the reality. I perception, it's my, let's see, match my face is from my memory or perception, I'm so confused. Please help me understand more, thank you. Sure, so I mean, the, the reason why I did that, uh, both of the um, thought experiments is that when we're, you know, in both of those times, we closed our eyes, and we we I, the, the the goal was to imagine an image, which our eyes provide us. So if we don't have an image coming from our eyes, the image that we form has to come from our memory, from our from the mind itself, and it has to come from many. It might you know it depends on on who you are as a person, what experiences you've had, but it can come from very deep memory, it can come from recent memory. So in your case, what happened was that the memory that came to mind was the, that model of the, you know, the, the sphere the, the, or circles, concentric circles that I had, that image came to your mind, which is fine, that's normal, because that's something that you saw just a few minutes prior to that. And that's natural for that to happen. Um, and, and so whenever we're imagining something, um, this is something that I didn't get too much to do, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit at, at closing, but um, our memories and thoughts, so when we're forming our sense of reality, um, not only do our, does our reality form from perception of things from the outside world, but also things from the inside world, our memories. And that's an example where, um, you know, the purpose of that experiment was to force each of us to only rely on our inner world to create this experience of a memory. Okay. And Kevin, you did that, but you didn't create the image of your face. You created the image of the, of the, of this, uh, concentric circles, um, which is fine. So it's just, you know, it's just another aspect. Our memories and the, our internal mind, internal world and the outside world, both are important to us. And that's what that showed. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Judith, Mike, and Vanessa. Judith. Sanjay, how does our sense of time um, relate to consciousness? The great variation that we can have, whether it's drug-induced or otherwise. Um, yeah, so sense of time is, is you know, there's, if, you, if you read about this concept of flow, right, um, it's, it's really interesting and amazing. Um, our sense of time is also um, like a rubber band. It, it is variable, it depends on, um, it depends on, it depends on the state of mind that you're in. It depends on um, what you're doing, the your mood, you might say. Uh, so time is is also like a like a rubber band that that can expand, or, or think of it this way: every second or every minute, right? And and the physical world has a fixed duration, but if you're in a rush, then a minute will go by pretty fast. But if you're waiting in a doctor's office for something or you're waiting somewhere that you don't want to be, that minute will seem like it's longer. So it depends on your, your mental state. Um, it, it is variable. And to some extent, it's under our control. 
Thank you. Next up is uh, Mike followed by Vanessa. Folks, if you have questions or if you want to talk about what you got from this meetup, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Mike. Uh, yeah, Sanjay, thank you so much for the time. Uh, in the second half of the presentation, when you brought up uh, synesthesia, that's something I've always been fascinated uh, with. I, I wanted to know if you knew about Daniel Tammet, um, who wrote the book Born on a Blue Day, which is a real deep delve into that. And if you had any thoughts about how synesthesia and consciousness in general kind of uh, go together, if you could just talk about that for a moment. Well, synesthesia is a different state, um, it's, or it's a different um, way of functioning that the that brain can have. It's, it's not tied to consciousness directly, but they can overlap. You, you, a person with synesthesia obviously has consciousness and they would have all the elements. And synesthesia itself is not a all or nothing type of thing. There are different types of synesthesia. There are different levels of synesthesia. Um, they're, they're even... even um, over time, well, it doesn't seem to change much, but there have been cases where um, the type of synesthesia a person has has slightly changed over, over many years. So, um, and I don't wanna to go too much into it, but synesthesia basically is where um, information input signals from one sensory uh, or set of or organs um, fuses, blends into the processing part of the brain that processes sensory input from a different organ sensory organ. So for example, um, the sound that you hear normally goes to your temporal lobes and it stays in the temporal lobes and it's processed there. And it, it, it allows us to understand audio and speech. Um, but if the signals of audio signals also flow further deeper into our visual cortex, then every time you hear any audio, it will cause you to see things. And different frequencies or tones will actually might actually be associated with colors or they might be associated with shapes, or they might be associated with, with textures, you know, or certain aspects, visual aspects. So sound would take on visual characteristics. That's one example of a single um, sensory modality intermixing with a second one. And it could be that they both intermix together in the reverse direction, or it could be that one intermixes with multiple. So sound might, might go into your visual and your taste. So when you hear sound, you might not only see the sound, you might actually taste the sound also. So it's very, very different. But people who are born this way, it's not unusual for them because that's the way the world is. That's why when I talked about, um, if, what, no matter what type of sensory systems you're born with, your brain mind adapts to it. This is why synesthesia is normal and those people can function fully in the world. Although they have difficulty explaining it to others because when they're, when they're young, they don't realize other people don't have that. And they assume that everyone has it. But later they realize that they have a special, you know, uh, perceptions, and mm -hmm. that can cause some differences that they try to resolve. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, next up is Vanessa. Okay, I found this presentation uh, quite interesting and uh, helpful. How uh, both uh, concepts are independent, but together they make the unique individual. But my question is, if there's maybe a better, actual, precise term, I'm going to use the term quasi-functional reality, because I had a dream, um, and as I'm dreaming, it was like I was the critic, director, producer, and actor all at once. I'm realizing what I was actually dreaming was making no sense, and it was like the director saying, cut, and I bolted out of sleep. But like, I, I can't remember what the actual dream, which made no sense was, but it was, I was very aware, and even after waking up, knowing that I had dreamed something, it was the most bizarre thing. Um, is there like a term for something like that? Or is that unusual for that to happen? Like, I don't know if I ate something weird earlier in the day, I can't even uh, give something that could have possibly caused that. That makes any sense. Yeah, um, I mean, that does not sound abnormal. Um, I mean, you, you, um, the type of dream you had, you had multiple roles in, that's fine. There's nothing unusual about that. Um, and and you, you woke up abruptly when you heard someone say cut. So you were attuned to something and, and that's what happens in a movie, you know, when the director says cut, actually something must happen. So in a sense, your, your mind was paying attention. It was aware of what was happening in your dream. Um, and, and whether you were, I, I don't remember if you said you were, uh, um, 
whether you were uh, lucid or not, but whether you were or not, that, that's a characteristic of, of that time when you were dreaming. It, it, may have been, um, it may have been a state that your brain was in before you went to sleep, or if that's something that normally happens to you, that may be how your, your dreams happen. Um, it doesn't sound, I don't know, it doesn't sound totally abnormal. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Sanjay. Um, that's all. What was that? About uh, the she was asking if there is a term for it. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in dreams. I don't know if there is a term for it. There may be. I don't know. Wonderful. Um, so, folks, let's just step back and look at this entire series on neuroscience. Um, many of you have attended multiple of these meetups. Uh, some of you are new. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I particularly like this series for, for various reasons. I mean, one, one of the reasons is that this is a crucial new topic. And if you, for the first time you're figuring out uh, what is going on in here, and it's just so complex, but science is making progress, but it is very hard to actually collate all the information and kind of figure out the to-dos from it, uh, try to separate out spurious data from really solid uh, kind of conversion data and do that in a way where it remains accessible. And that's what uh, you know, Sanjay uh, is able to do. So, um, so I'm very, very thrilled about this series. Um, I think this is really, really valuable to build up things. Um, and so, uh, so I'm, you know, this is, this is just great. And we are gonna continue doing that for the rest of the year. Uh, Sanjay is gonna keep picking topics, which he, uh, both which he thinks are kind of critical topics in the field, as well as uh, topics on which he's interested, has something to say on. So that's, that's what we are doing. Uh, so I, I really like the series. So Sanjay, I think this is going amazingly well. Uh, anybody else who has been on kind of at least two of these meetups, if you have any comments about uh, about the series, um, any thoughts about what you know about your approach to studying the brain, studying neuroscience, uh, this is a good time to kind of just step back and look at kind of neuroscience or you know study of the brain. Uh, if you have comments, just brief comments, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, so Sanjay, um, what's I mean. Uh, is, is that a fair way of describing what you're trying to do? How, how do you think of it? What are you trying to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I mean, this, this is, this is a, a, one of my favorite topics. I have many, but this is one of my favorite. And I want to share with everyone um, what, I, what I've learned what, and what I continue to learn because I, I obviously have to, to brush up on, on things that, that I learned in the past. Um, my memory is not as good as it used to. So um, that's one of the reasons why I can't remember some, th some of the things when, when someone asks a question, you may not notice it, but sometimes I can't remember something. Um, so for me, the, the, the most, um, what I really wanna share are, are things that are not obvious because I think that helps us to really understand ourselves better. Um, for example, I mean, I, so for me, I, I, many of these concepts I've known for so many years, but just in one of the breakout sessions, um, Somebody described something that that for them was novel, and and in the back of my mind, I thought, wow, it is novel if you don't if you're unaware of it. I mean, for me, for me, I understood because because I built layers further beyond that because that's something that that's established. But um, what I hope is that when people learn new things and it it helps them to see the world in a new light and ourselves in a new light, that you continue learning. Not necessarily just this, but I hope because all of these information that we learned, like in, in the breakout session, somebody else gave an example where um, we, you know, the example was around how, you know, or, or around optical illusions, that when we are, um, when we realize there are optical illusions in our visual system, there also are optical illusions in our um, perceptual system in other ways, for example, our emotional perception. So when we're talking to someone, um, we may, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to find the person who, who made the comment. I didn't, I don't see their, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, the, uh, oh, uh, Goran, I think he, uh, yeah, he's on the other page. So he, he, he had said that um, when he's talking to someone and he sees another person's face appear to be angry, 
Okay. Normally people think of it and they make a judgment and they start to react to that angry face. But he's, what he said is that by him now knowing that our brains distort reality sometimes and sometimes often you know, or sometimes severely, what he realizes is that if he sees a face and it appears to be angry, he doesn't simply react to that. He thinks, he, his mind re realizes that that person may not be angry. It's just that he's falsely interpreting it as angry face and the person may not be angry at all. And that's a very important aspect of interpersonal communication. So these things that we learn um, can help us become better people. That's the most important aspect that I think. I, I think it's it's important to do. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a long line from kind of science, you know, kind of science to morality or science to kind of effective kind of self improvement, whatever you want to call it, kind of application. Of, of those ideas. I mean, that's the, that's the whole reason to be doing science in the long run. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it is a very challenging thing uh, in this particular field. So I think, um, and I, I like your idea. And I, I think I like the examples that you take, like, for example, that example of the, um, uh, the, the light and dark colors illusion that that was just beautiful. Beautiful because you, you could just move it and you could you could actually illustrate it and uh, what it does is that it just what happens is that people underestimate what is going on in here just the levels of processing that is going on the depth of it and the richness of it and its effectiveness as providing a useful way of dealing with reality in real time at appropriate speed, uh, it's, it's just incredible. So, so thank you very much. And we look forward to your next presentation. Thanks, thanks. All right, uh, folks. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll see you back soon. Take care.